Hey, and here we go. We got some attendees showing up. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I am going to um, enable our live transcription. There we go. Good to see so many familiar uh, names. Uh, no faces today, unfortunately. This is the webinar. <laughs> I, I see a bunch of names that I know. I, I talk to a lot of you on a, uh, on a weekly basis, and I'm so glad that you're joining us today to talk about uh, why financial aid communication is so darn complicated and how we can't make it a little more simple and a little more consolidated. So we are going to get started in just a few minutes, but I'm going to allow everyone to uh, have a few minutes to get uh, in the waiting room and get yourself a cup of coffee or something like that um, before we get started. Just to let everyone know, uh, I can field a few questions in the chat kind of as uh, Alyssa is speaking and we can do a little Q&A section uh, at the end of the presentation to make sure that you have all your questions answered. We are going to be recording this and we are going to be sharing the slide deck. So right now the webinar is being recorded and we're happy to send that recording link out. We're also going to be hosting it on the trelliscompany.org website. So if you've missed it, if you have any colleagues who want to check it out, don't worry about that. You'll be getting a PDF copy of the slide deck and then a recording of the webinar uh, for future viewing um, shortly after the presentation. I am going to make sure to download everyone's uh, email addresses and I can send everyone a follow-up email. Uh, Inez, it's good to see you too. We gotta, we gotta catch up soon. It's been a while since uh, we, I connected with EPCC, but uh, I was thinking about everyone, um, especially a couple months ago, obviously Texas just got through some really rough winter weather, but I know um, uh, the city of El Paso had really been hit hard by COVID and uh, I was thinking about all of our uh, El Paso colleagues there for a while. It was a pretty dire time, but I'm I'm glad that at least the folks that I've spoken with, friends are okay, families are are mostly okay. So um, I'm I'm really glad to see that. But it's it's good to see you too, and as I miss you, we gotta we gotta talk uh, we gotta talk football again. Um, <laughs> hey, Liz to Iowa sent down some forces. That's interesting you say that too, because I had a couple of friends um, and family from Wisconsin say that a couple of Wisconsin plumbers had made the drive down to Texas and they were doing contract work around Houston, um, fixing up people's uh, pipes and stuff and digging up people's yards. And it was a pretty, um, pretty incredible amount of damage that some people had uh, experienced. So um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Liz says a uh, buddy came down with his plow fleet. Yeah, that was really interesting to hear about. There were a lot of Texas municipalities that didn't own a plow and there was no snow or there was no salt for the snow or there was no de-icer. So there were entire like little townships and, and cities that didn't have a snow plow <laughs> uh, or a snow shovel. You know, I've kept that in the trunk of my car for literally decades, just in case. Uh, even though I've been, uh, you know, living in Texas for a few years. So anyway, it is past 11 o'clock. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Zach. I work at uh, Trellis Company as an institutional support consultant. I know many of you kind of from uh, the Trellis extended family and then just, you know, in the financial aid talks uh, around the country. I'm a, I'm a financial aid communication nerd. Uh, proudly, like many of you are on this call. And we're nerds about it largely because it's it can be so complicated and you have to have a really in-depth knowledge of financial aid jargon and communication to guide students through these processes. It's, it's, it's not like you can have a surface level understanding and help students with every single issue they have. And a huge shout out to any of y'all who are working in financial literacy in the financial wellness space, right? A very important kind of subfield, I would say, in financial aid. Uh, those of y'all who are administering her funds or Carissa funds and emergency aid, and you're running the food pantries, and that is a whole nother level of financial literacy and financial aid knowledge that y'all need to have to support students so that they can be their best selves. So thank you to everyone, not only working in financial aid, but recognizing the people in the financial wellness and literacy space, equally important. Uh, I will now introduce my co-speaker and co-presenter and my, my academic sister from another mister, 
uh, Alyssa. Alyssa, do you want to introduce yourself quickly and let everyone know kind of your background and what your interest is is in uh, in, in financial uh, literacy and financial aid communication? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, my name is Alyssa Pectori. I'm the assistant director for our Student Financial Management Center. I actually manage our Georgia State Call Center um, on behalf of financial aid and student accounts. And then my AVP <laughs> takes advantage of the other duties assigned in my job description. And I also um, am very fortunate to work with multiple campus partners um, at our institution on communications, text messaging, social media, um, emailing through um, Marketing Cloud with Salesforce. Um, so I uh, kind of fell into to communications, and there's a lot of people at Georgia State that work on them, and I've been very fortunate to be selected to speak today and share our journey. Cool, absolutely. Well, well-deserved, Alyssa. I'm so, I'm so happy to have you. And one disclaimer I want to make to everyone is even though um, you know, Alyssa might use certain technologies in every single institution. You know, you might use Salesforce. You, you might do a lot of stuff through Slate or Banner or whatever your student information system is. A lot of the guidance today is going to span all those technologies. So it's kind of like this basic principles, right? We're not going to be talking about how to load student data sets and, and clean databases using the specific software program. We're talking about like the, some of the basics of simplifying and consolidating financial aid communication so that you can take those principles, see some real world examples, and then do it on your system and what works for your institution. That is kind of the flexibility of today's presentation is that it doesn't really matter where you come from, from a technology perspective, we got you covered. So I'm gonna launch into it um, talking about simplifying and consolidating financial aid communication. So I'm going to show you a slide here uh, in just a second. Hold on, let me reshare my screen. Um, I'm going to move my little transcription here. Uh, so here is the FSA website for financial aid jargon. Now this screenshot kind of tells a very long and complicated story. What do you say when you're publishing a jargon website about how to complete certain processes? I think about when I am trying to understand something like a build instruction set for a picnic table, something like that. If I don't understand a word, I go look it up because you need to understand certain words to complete certain processes. That's just how kind of a basic tenet of literacy works, building blocks of a language. So FSA is saying, here is the information that you may need to know to understand the entire process and there are hundreds of terms within the FSA glossary or the, the jargon guide to understanding financial aid. So thinking to yourselves about what does it mean when we have to publish jargon and glossary guides to help students understand a process? Should the information bar perhaps be that high for students to understand a process fully and their support networks to understand it fully? And as FSA has started their glossary, other institutions of higher education now have their financial aid glossaries or their financial aid jargon guides. So I'm not taking one step back. Not only is there a certain threshold of understanding that you need to complete the federal processes, but institutions are also saying, here's what you may encounter at the federal process, at the federal level, and then here's what we have at the institutional level. So you can see how the information kind of burden and the level kind of keeps getting raised higher and higher and higher because as students navigate federal processes, they also have to you know, navigate institutional processes and then possibly state processes. Students might get financial aid at the state level, the institutional level and the federal level and they all have different guides to understanding what language they are using throughout the process. That is pretty interesting to me. And it's not just Western Illinois, any WIU folks. Uh, if you're in, in the audience today, thank you for coming. I'm not picking on you. I'm gonna pick on kind of the entire system here because now there is simple verification jargon guides, right? So on the left-hand side of the screenshot under FAFSA verification, there's an outline of the verification process and then all of the verification glossary of terms. So now, the jargon and the language gets even more complex and it changes depending on where you are in the financial aid process. 
So when you're initially exploring completing the FAFSA, you have to kind of clear one language hurdle. Then as you go through institutional processes, you clear another hurdle. If you go through a state process, you clear another hurdle. But then as your application processes through the federal system, there are additional hurdles you have to cross. And some students may never be selected for verification and may never encounter some of that language. But then you understand that there are certain student groups that may be forced to learn a certain language to accomplish a certain task or get through a certain process that other students might not have to. On the back end then, understanding the award letter, right? So there are a glossary of terms published by NASFA for understanding financial aid offers. So not only is the language different at the institutional and state and federal level, but also what type of communication comes from the institution dictates largely your understanding of these financial aid topics and whether or not a student can understand their offer and then align that offer to maybe their institution of best fit and connect the dots between their academics and their financial aid. So to backpedal for just a second, here is a short outline of the reality that students face for applying for financial aid. Here's the process. Students bounce back and forth from federal to institutional multiple times. If they need help with their FSA ID or you know, they need help uh, understanding like you know, how their, their parent may or may not be a dependent or their family size, that question can sometimes be answered by a federal source or an institutional source. There are lots of nonprofits like Trellis that help students understand those kinds of those pieces of information. But notice how many different times a student has to go back and forth between different sources. And then there's jargon throughout those processes and the jargon is not consistent through those processes. Then students may receive communication through multiple channels. And then think to yourselves from the institution side, is that communication consistent? Are students getting messaging in the same syntax, so same sentence structure, and the same semantics, so same word choice across text message and email and snail mail? How about their federal portal? How about their institutional portal? Depending on how many institutions they apply to, they may have 10 institutional portals that they have to navigate through. Now think about how much information that takes and then how much language understanding that takes. And here's where we discover perhaps a gap between your first gen students who have never encountered any of this financial aid language in their entire lives and second, third, fourth gen students who have someone in their support network to help decode and kind of translate this language to smooth the process out. So I definitely think there needs to be some sort of communication consolidation and simplification between all these processes to make sure that any student, regardless of their generation status or their background, can access this language and make sure they can complete the process and understand what they've just done. So the overview of our webinar today is first focusing on why is this communication so difficult? And what does current literacy and readability research say about current college students? You will be surprised. <laughs> and then we, we kind of introduce a conceptual financial aid communication funnel. In enrollment management, it's very common to have, you know, leads or prospects, then you get your apply, then you get your admitted, and you get who you yield, right? It's kind of like an inverted pyramid. Same thing with financial aid communication but that pyramid goes in a bunch of different directions in a second. Then Alyssa is gonna step in and give some awesome context about what one institution actually did showing before and after examples of communication that was meant for student audiences and how you can simplify and consolidate that communication on your campus. Then we provide some best practices for simplifying and consolidating financial aid communication, even though a lot of it quite frankly, maybe out of your control, right? At the federal level or maybe at the state level or system level. And then we'll have some time for Q&A at the very end where we can share resources and kind of best practices. And we'd love to hear from y'all about what, what works on your campus because you know all the campuses are very different. So I will kick it over to Alyssa and she will talk a little bit more about Georgia State's kind of journey to simplicity here. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Zach. So, you know, very luckily, we have been on this journey for about three years now to change the way we're communicating with students. Um, and it's really been a institutional effort. Um, we, we're simply just getting a lot of complaints, right? Um, that our messaging was inconsistent, confusing, um, that they didn't know where to start or what to do next. Um, so we really started by examining our um, prospective student population, we find that the greatest overlap um, between departments happens between the admissions department and then between financial aid and student accounts once the student becomes a continuing student. Um, and so we really started looking at what communication do they receive from admission all the way to graduation. Um, and we really tried to be student journey focused and look at what the student experiences and kind of take ourselves out of it um, because we realized a lot of our communication was very motivated by what we wanted or what other departments were trying to accomplish with the student. And sometimes that was a little bit in conflict, conflict or coming at times where we were you know, giving them mixed messaging. So we really looked at multiple departments. We partnered with our marketing team, um, partnered with admissions significantly um, to find out where our overlaps occurred. And we found that students were just being inundated with tons of communication, emails. We were, you know, having them do webinars with us. We were sending them text messages. We were doing phone calls. Um, there were lots of social media posts. And the communications were either too complex or they were inconsistent and conflicting with each other, which was fairly obvious once we really kind of sat down and looked at all of the communications kind of in a line and the timing of them um, based on where the student was at either in the admissions process or as a continuing student. And, you know, the other thing was you know, beyond it being very obvious just by looking at the communications themselves, that was actually the feedback we were receiving from students. Students were very vocal about the fact that, you know, they'd get one email from admissions or they'd get one email from um, our department and then they'd see something on social media and it was not really aligned um, and it was affecting their behavior to where it was either confusing them and causing them to have a lot of questions or it was causing them to take no action at all. So we saw a significant need to align our not only our email communications and all of our messaging, but all of our webinars, our websites, and our social media posts so that hopefully everything would be in more clear, distinct step processes that were very easy to read and understand. Great point, Alyssa. And one thing I wanted to highlight is that Georgia State took the step to solicit student feedback. So that is really important. Uh, I have found that a lot of higher ed websites, even though they're student focused, a student has never given their input on it, whether or not they can actually read it. And one shout out that I always give is University of North Texas has a money management center um, and all of their communication uh, is student vetted. So before they put anything on the website, before they create a brochure or a pamphlet, they ask a student, does this make sense to you? Can you read this? And they work with the students to create student-centered content, which I think is really important to have a student feedback loop in some ways. And those can be, you know, your student employees or you can recruit them from student organizations. And you can find students who want to improve their institution. It's kind of a great way of kind of a future alumni giving, you know, giving a little bit of perspective on making communication a little bit more equitable. So as Alyssa was talking about, um, is the communication too complex? And I have found in my research and the higher community has found that yes, a lot of stuff is way too complex. So when I talk about readability, I'm talking about grade level measurements and essentially a grade level readability measure. It analyzes sentence structure, so syntax and semantics, so word choice and tests can produce a grade level measurement of reading comprehension. So for instance, you can run an analysis, and I could talk about this a little bit later if anyone has questions, but you can analyze the number of words per phrase, the number of phrases per clause, and the number of sentences per paragraph. And it might give you a score of 13, which would be a text that would be appropriate for 13 grade levels of English reading comprehension ability or uh, a first year student in college, right? So the, the grade level corresponding to the K-12 grade system in the US. And reading 
readability levels, reading measures have been used extensively, and they were a product of the, largely the, the Vietnam War conflict. So soldiers needed to be able to understand how to read technical manuals, and they were literally shipping over, you know, weaponry and machinery and tanks and helicopters in big pieces, and they needed to be assembled on the ground, literally on the battlefield, and they needed to have soldiers who could read technical instructions. You had to be literate to work in certain sectors of the, of the armed forces. And so all these readability measures came out in the 1970s and 1980s, and then slowly, K-12 school districts and national organizations adopted them as standards for assigning reading material to K-12 students. So now, if any of y'all have little ones in elementary school, they may be using the Scholastic Read 180 program or any other kind of leveled reading programs where students are assigned books based on their level of literacy and they might read and comprehend at a third grade level and they're assigned a fourth grade level book to extend and, and to increase their reading comprehension level. It all came from the US Department of Defense back in the 70s and 80s. Now, what might be surprising to you is the average US resident, the average US adult living in the US reads at about the seventh grade level, which is why magazines like Us Weekly are really, really popular because it's lots of pictures and lots of seventh grade level content. And only about a third of graduating high school seniors in the US actually read and comprehend at the 12th grade level. So lots of college students do not read and comprehend at a college level. A lot of them come in very deficient. And I found that a lot of material in higher ed is way beyond reading comprehension levels. I have looked at financial aid application instructions that institutions put on their websites, you know, how to complete the FAFSA between the 14th and 17th grade level. It's really, really complex. I've run into sentences that are 80, 90 words long that have seven or eight semicolons filled with acronyms, filled with jargon. It's really, really complex. And most prospective and current US college students can't read financial aid communication from their institution on the website or in emails, financial aid award letters. They're very, very complex, especially when you're getting to integrate federal jargon like direct and unsubsidized and subsidized and parent plus into financial aid letter or financial aid award letter that may incorporate institutional jargon as well. So it's compoundingly difficult as a student progresses. Here is one kind of conceptual model that Alyssa and I have worked on about the communication funnel and how it becomes more and more complex and incorporates information from different sources as you go. First, institutions tell students how to complete the FAFSA. So here's your school code, here's the information that you need, here's how to contact the institution if you need help. Then students move to the federal side to complete the FAFSA and maybe complete verification. Then they go back to the institution on how to read that institutional award letter or offer letter. They then bounce back to the federal side to read and sign their master promissory note. And they stay at that federal side and there is new entrance counseling now that may be more simpler than entrance counseling in the past but that's still federal level. Then they bounce back to institution side to read and complete any SAP requirements because that's a condition of, of, of getting financial aid. And then the renewal process all over again not really integrating institutional or state scholarships into this funnel. So students are constantly bouncing back and forth between institutional and federal and institutional and federal, maybe throwing some state in there. And you can see how over time that may grind a student down in terms of the amount of communication they have to understand to, uh, to complete financial aid processes. And then on top of that, as Alyssa mentioned earlier, the modes of communication are many as well. There's websites, there's the FAFSA.gov website, institutional websites, there's text messages, there's phone calls, there's mail, there's email. So all these different modes of communication and all these different sources and the result, the end result is a very complicated financial aid communication funnel. So Alyssa, do you wanna talk at all about kind of what Georgia State has done in, in some of these steps and how you've kind of seen some gaps and how you've made things a little simpler? 
Yeah, so one of the things that we've done significantly both with our initial admissions letters as well as our continuing student processes, our website, is to try to break down this funnel into five very palatable steps for students. Learn about financial aid, apply, check to see if you have verification, accept your funds, and then check for balances, right? Um, and additional funding that you might need. So we really try to make it the student action steps where they need to step back in and take action. Um, and then we try to formulate and push communication to them that will prompt that action that we'd like to see while kind of trying to not inundate them with all of the extra things that we may be doing on the back end, um, you know, that they don't really need to, to pay attention to. So we don't need all of that in our process um, for them to understand where they are and what they need to do. Yeah, so great point. We try to point. make everything that, sorry. Um, you know, so all of our emails, our website, we want everything to kind of be putting out those same simple messages. Yeah, breaking down the process into steps, right? Palatable steps and students understanding those steps, really, really, really important. So really the reality of applying for financial aid here is that granted that students bounce back and forth, there's jargon throughout and students receive all these different kinds of communication. What we have to keep in mind is that most college students do not read and comprehend at the college level. And most of our students even though they may not advocate for help and they may try to do it on their own because they don't want to be seen as needing help, they likely cannot read and comprehend what we're sending them in terms of financial aid. Just keeping that in mind that there's probably a pretty steep learning curve. Once a student goes through the process once, maybe that bar is lowered and the communication is more consistent and students can read and understand words and carry them from one year to the next but especially for the FTICs and the first generation and college students, really, really difficult first hurdle. So now Alyssa is gonna talk a little bit about steps in that process and what Georgia State has done specifically to kind of simplify that process throughout. I think these are fantastic examples. So um, as, I, as we discussed, one of the first steps we did was um, partner with our admissions and marketing team to align our the look and feel of our emails, but also to really kind of break everything down into a step-by-step -step process for the student. So this is an example of kind of our before, go complete your FAFSA application email, and then the after version that we started sending students, where you can see that there's a clear step right there at the top, that two um, is the um, apply step for them. At the bottom of the emails, which we'll show you in another example, you can kind of see the progression on the steps in each email. So the student is kind of visually trained to see those steps and know where they're at in the process. Um, we didn't, we actually added more language for this, but we tried to keep the action at the very top and let them know that, you know, they need to complete the application as soon as possible and then layer in videos that they could um, use to, on how to apply for FAFSA so that they can receive normal information that we might send them in an email, which might be paragraphs and paragraphs of why it's important to complete the FAFSA in um, maybe shorter clips that are more consumable for them that they might be more likely to listen to rather than read through. Um, but the big start was kind of changing the look and feel to align with our brand image and make the steps very clear to students. Great point. And, and semantically, I'm going to nerd out quickly. Notice on the, on the left-hand side in the email, it starts with we, the word we. On the right-hand side, it starts with the word you. Using that second person language, you should do this. Talk to the student directly. Make that communication much more direct. As it reads to me, it's much more direct. And then see how the, the FSA code, that, that FAFSA code pops out in the second paragraph on the right-hand side. You can easily find that code. You can easily click here to complete the FAFSA. It's a much simpler email. So kudos, Georgia State, very, very simple. 
So for our next example, you can see that this is the third step. This is our check step. So we want them to check to see if they're selected for verification. And so we send this out to students. We, what we did was we cut out a lot of the language again, um, or as much as we possibly could, and tried to make the next step and what we wanted them to go do, which was we wanted them to go log into their, their portal um, to complete you know, whatever verification steps we posted out there for them. We tried to put that in a big red block so that it was very, you know, attention grabbing. Um, and again, we aligned it with our brand image and, um, you know, just tried to make these steps more visually clear and aligned with, you know, the steps in the process. Mm -hmm. and another great point too, in comparing the before and after, look at how many words got cut you see that big number three so students know where they are in a process so it's linear for them and then this letter actually defines verification on the right hand side and bolds it and underlines it and then underneath there here's that easy little checklist so not only is the language pared down but it's a little more explicit in what it's telling the student to do and what this thing called verification is and then, as Alyssa said, the attention grabbing aspect of it, I mean, that pause is in red. I can see it very clearly on my screen. It jumps out at you, right? I mean, it's attention grabbing, leveraging technologies and building those attention grabbing elements into your communication is huge to getting students to focus on what you need them to focus on so they can complete the process, get into your institution and then, and then enroll. Uh, next up, award letters. These are also really interesting. Yeah, so we actually had to separate the slides for award letters because the initial award letter was so long, um, it really needed, you know, both images to capture it. Um, so there's quite a bit going on with our award letter change. So the, the first thing that I'll say is this is probably the letter that we had feedback on that was the most confusing to students. And the reason for this is because um, at the top, you can see we give them all of the award information straight away. We just regurgitate, this is what we're going to award you, which is obviously, you know, it's award letter, so you, that's the most important thing. Um, and then we give them information about the um, federal shopping sheet, a lot of legalese and, you know, policy related <laughs> information um, to explain what the award letter is and why it's important. And then at the very end of the email, we would bury the action we would want them to take. We wanted them to go in, log in, review their actual award letter in their portal, and then actually take the action of accepting their funds and get the instructions to complete their loan counseling and master promissory notes. So we got tons of feedback that this letter was not effective, um, especially with new students who would get this award letter and they'd say, I'm awarded, I'm done, it's great. <laughs> and they had no idea because they would not read all the way down to the end of the email um, that they needed to take additional steps to really complete their file. And so, um, so this was one that we definitely felt we needed to revamp considerably. Um, and so, Yep, on this page, we have kind of our after letter. We changed the action to the very top. We started with, you've been awarded, and we want you to go look at your award rather than just giving them the award information um, within the letter. So we start with the action we want them to take. And then rather than adding in a bunch of language and policy information and regulation information that we don't really think that they were reading through at all whatsoever, we added in a video about what the award is and what it means. So we actually embedded that straight into the, the video rather than linking it away to try to encourage them to watch it. And then um, this is the example where you can see kind of at the bottom of the email how the email is of a series of steps right? So it's very clear that you're progressing and we expect you to progress all the way through to this completion step. So this indicates also there's still more for you to do, potentially more for you to review. So, you know, keep, keep progressing along, please. Um, and we really tried to condense this so that it was much more palatable and clear that they needed to continue to do something. So great points, Alyssa, and tying to something that someone asked in the Q&A about how do you align language across multiple units, right? How do you get buy-in? So one of the big tips is, you know, use student-centered language. So address them, use a second person pronoun, say you, 
you know, in this award letter, notice your financial aid package. In the earlier FAFSA completion, you, it's all about you. You should do these things. Guess what? This process applies to you, so you can do these things. And then the parlance across multiple emails, pause. Notice how they're not spelling out that acronym. They're not referring to it as a student portal or anything. It's log into your pause account. That is how it is referred to, and that's common language throughout all forms of communication. So one tip for institutions is you got to get the admissions folks and the enrollment management folks and the financial aid folks in a room and get consolidated, agreed upon language, and then make sure all that communication actually uses that language. I cannot tell you the number of times I have encountered something at an institution that will not be named <laughs> that uh, was referred to in one way when I was a prospective student. And then it changed a little bit when I was being onboarded. And then now that I've uh, moved on from this institution, uh, it's it's phrased in a slightly different way. And it drives me crazy because it's, it's different names for the same thing. And that's confusing to students. Alyssa, do you have any kind of examples of that? How you kind of collaborated and, and got a consistency of language established? Yeah, so, um, you know, Georgia, Georgia State, I'm not sure how many people know a little bit about our history, but we consolidated with a um, community college system within Georgia, the Georgia Perimeter Colleges. So they're now a undergraduate um, college that we have running our associates programs. Um, so we went from like 30,000 students to like 50 some odd thousand students, had to consolidate a lot of things. Um, and our student success um, umbrella that we're, our department is under is also contains admissions and academics. And so some of the more operational, um, you know, units of the university. So, you know, having the same, associate, you know, vice president, um, really kind of helped align things. But also when we merged, we created our, this new department and, um, you know, apparently the processing offices were maybe not as collaborative previously. I hear sometimes from social media, especially that it was a little bit difficult to get a hold of our offices. Um, you know, there wasn't maybe as much collaboration um, prior to our merger, but we've really transitioned that significantly. And really, I know it sounds really simple, we just meet very regularly. So we meet every two weeks with our admissions office year round and marketing joins that meeting. And we have, um, you know, people from orientation in that meeting and we talk about communication and, you know, when we're starting, you know, renewal communication, when we start communicating with fall applicants, what we're sending them, um, you know, we're constantly revamping those communications and, um, trying to collaborate together. And I, I think it's just, you know, we've built this partnership where we're just more receptive to trying to align everything because it was just not, it was not functional, not, um, you know, having all of our messaging and the website and all of our communications, um, you know, just kind of sent out in one vacuum of the of our department. Um, we, we really needed to partner with everybody so that you know, we're sending the same message, you know, because we all really have the same goals. <laughs> um, it seems really simple. I, I know it's not. <laughs> so, um, so I, you know, we're, I, we're just really lucky that in the past, you know, four years, five years, everybody's really gotten on board with, you know, just being very aligned in some of those things. Yeah. And that's too, like in my professional capacity, I hear a lot of institutions say, it's tough to get everyone in the room together. It's tough to find that time. I mean, it's not like breaking down decades and decades worth of siloing between, you know, the front end of the house, the admissions room and management team, and then financial aid, and then pulling in marketing and making sure everything looks consistent and feels consistent and the user experience and the user interfaces are similar. It's a huge task, but you might find that on the back end, once you've done the work and everything's aligned, all of a sudden, those check-in meetings are more so just really, truly check-in meetings. We're, we're continuing to do what we said we're doing instead of building it all from scratch and having to do, do all the, you know, realignment 
in real time as students need things and as faculty and staff need things. The planning might help you save some time in the back end eventually. Um, we're going to talk about a few more examples. Here is SAP letters, and I talk with a lot of institutions about how you communicate SAP. I really like these. So, uh, Alyssa, what do you think? Yeah, so, so this is kind of shifting away from some of that work we had done with um, admissions and creating steps and aligning all of our steps to simplify things for our students. Um, you know, since we've started this communication journey, we've tried a lot of different things. Um, I think one of the things about Georgia State is we really try to take up that um, mantle of being experimental and, and um, not being afraid to try, try different things. So we've dabbled in like behavioral economics concepts like loss aversion or reciprocity. Um, and one of the things we decided to really revamp was this SAP email. So this is a traditional SAP communication that we would send to some of our students when they were not meeting SAP. Um, you can see it, it's very full of information. All this information is very pertinent to the student situation. But one of the things that we found with this email is we just felt like it was so negative, right? I mean, SAP is a really hard subject. I know everybody knows that, right? Um, but we wanted to see if there was some way that we could communicate this with maybe a little bit more empathy and kindness, maybe a more supportive tone, and also really simplify the action. Like, I don't need to go into all of the things, you know, about the actual policy in this email. I really just need to know, need you to know, this isn't the end of the road for you. So there's something you can do. We have an appeal process. You can get on an academic plan, but sometimes all of that is much easier to communicate if they simply contact us and we can communicate some of that information. So what we did was we, I mean, we, we got really kind of like trying to pull from inspirational quotes and, you know, be very motivating. We're really proud of your accomplishments. People stumble all the time. It's how you recover, right? So we really tried to revamp the way we were communicating. You're not meaning that, but that's okay. There's something we can do to help you. And we wanted it to be as simple as send us a case and ask us for the appeal and we will contact you and let you know what you need to do. So that way we could have some very critical coaching conversations with this smaller population of our students. Um, and then we, you know, and then of course we are, we want to communicate exactly why they're not meeting SAP, but we put that all at the bottom because what we really want them to know is there's, there's something for you to do we, and we can help you with this. So we're happy to go over exactly why you're not meeting SAP and we'll put that in the email. But the first thing we want you to know is there's something that you can do about not meeting SAP and we want you to take that action. Great points and, and notice too how the softening of the language kind of moves that maybe accusatory language, you know, it's, this is your fault, you need to do this. That's actually kind of couched in the second paragraph and just saying review of records show that you did not achieve satisfactory academic progress. It's a lot softer than leading with, you need to do this panic and fire and brimstone, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really a lot softer and a lot better organized. And you can just see in the comparison, the language is pared down substantially much, much easier to read. So Alyssa now is going to talk a little bit about kind of the 21-22 FAFSA communication and some real world examples, kind of their process for simplifying. It's brilliant stuff. So Alyssa, take it away. Yeah. So I, you know, I don't know about brilliant, but we, we certainly are willing to give anything a shot pretty much. <laughs> so, um, so essentially, you know, everyone I'm sure does fast for renewal campaigns every single year. Um, and it's, it can be very daunting to come up with new and creative ways to try to encourage students to get the fast for their early when let's just be honest, they don't really want to get it done early, I think sometimes. Um, so we tried to take a very different approach this year, um, you know, from a very heavy content communication to more of a one-click communication. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means in, a, in just a moment. And we're, we're not ex afraid to experiment. So we did do some AB or ABC type testing um, where we tested out these one-click communications. Um, because we've learned over the past three years that 
you know, students' attention spans are really only the size of a tweet or a text, right? And, you know, if our subject line for our email maybe was not um, very attention can't catching, maybe they weren't going to open up the email. On average, our emails get about a 13% open rate, um, and we're very fortunate to have be able to collect that data. Um, and we also see that if we're not following up with a very simplified text message with our email, sometimes we're really not getting the responses that we're, we're looking for. So we know, we know just through the experience of the last three years that, you know, condensing things or the likelihood of students reading our emails is just um, sometimes hit or miss. And we wanted to try some different approaches to see if we could get our students' attention. Um, on October 1st, <laughs> so <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> so um, here's an example of the prior year's Fast for Renewal email, and you can see it's long. Um, we, we, you know, it does kind of show our journey. It's aligned with the brand image. It does start with the ac action first. It is, um, you know, trying to be very positive. And then we do bury some of these behavioral economics concepts uh, concepts at the bottom, because again, we're trying to incentivize them, give them all the reasons that they might want to complete their FAFSA early and why it's good to do that. But it's, it's you know, it's, it's a standard email you would see us send. Um, I wrote this email, so I'm going to try not to be too hard on myself. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I mean, we're definitely shifting more and more away from this type of lengthy, very lengthy email. And so then, so essentially what we decided to do this year was to do some, some A-B testing, essentially. We split our student population up into three groups. We actually also email their parents, because um, we're not scared of emailing them. We're like, hey, parents, go make your student do their FAFSA. <laughs> um, but the FAFSA communication, um, the first, the control group, was just a very standard email, very similar to the one above it uh, from last year. And the only thing we really changed was we really cut the information down to just the action we wanted them to complete. Go complete it early. Here's the information. If you need help, here's some videos that are going to help you. And we sent that out um, to our students. And then <laughs> with the other two treatment groups, what we decided to do was send a one-click image um, where the subject line also um, mimicked this play on words that we were using for our um, mascot. Our mascot is Pounce the Panther. So we, um, we used this one-click image, embedded the link to FAFSA into it, and just made it very simple. And the pause and prepare for your future was also the subject line. So we were trying to make the subject line prompt them to open the email. Um, and then, so we did one group. And then just for a little bit of diversity, we also had another one-click email with a different play on words. This one was pounce on your financial aid early. That was also the subject line. The subject line for the first email was, FAFSA is open, complete it early, please. <laughs> so, um, so we were trying to have whatever the subject line was be intriguing enough that they would then open the email without telling them, you know, what we wanted them to do was complete the FAFSA early. <laughs> um, so we um, so we sent out the, this email to our fall population of students who had completed the prior year's FAFSA application after splitting them up into three groups, and then th these were our results. So we do test over the course of about three to five days is what we look at. Um, you really are going to see the most response, or what we've found, is that we see the most open rates within the first 48 hours. But we do track over five days because sometimes students get an email midweek and then they circle back to it over the weekend. Um, so essentially, the control email performed right as we would expect it to. On average, we see about a 13% open rate um, and about a 1.5% to 2% click rate. So the first email we would consider that pretty standard across the board. Where we saw a significant difference was with our treatment groups. So the subject and the one-click image does seem to have been um, very successful in terms of intriguing the students enough to open it at a higher rate. So we saw almost a 30, you know, 29% open rate for both of those one-click images. And then um, 
we saw almost a four and a half percent click rate, um, which, you know, was strikingly different than the control group. So we do what we we feel like we've learned over the course of these last years is that, again, attention span, readability, simplifying the message, making things attention grabbing, really utilizing that subject line in the email, um, you know, will hopefully drive um, activity and or responsiveness or catch your students' attention. We also followed this up with text message nudges. We use some of this language in our social media, the pause and prepare for the future, the pounce on your financial aid early. Um, we'll continue to run campaigns this year um, that are geared towards this uh, FAFSA renewal, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in, in, in in similar message fashion, but we're thinking about expanding some of these one-click messages out to other activities as well. Go complete your verification, link away to the portal, go register, link away to the portal, things like that where the messaging is just very sim simple and action-oriented. Totally agree. Uh, and what I like too, and, and maybe I'm not surprised that pause and complete the FAFSA. And this is this was for returning students, right? For basically for renewals. Mm -hmm. So those students may have been familiar with that language. You know, pause was an acronym that they knew. They knew that that was something that pertained to them. And there you see, you know, the, the open rate and the click rates. I mean, making those emails and those nudges very simple on brand, and using language that the student is already familiar with. I mean, you, you get pause and FAFSA, you would think, wait a minute, those are both acronyms. Those should be complicated. Well, they're not because the student audience was students who would have already learned that language. So you're just reinforcing that meaning. It follows a lot of great kind of literacy best practices. And, and speaking of best practices, well, here they come. Great segue. <laughs> so here is what Alyssa and I kind of put our heads together to think about in terms of future iterations of financial aid communication and what institutions can actually do. So first and foremost, consider each level of the funnel. What are students encountering at the federal level, institutional level, state level? If any of y'all are interested, you know, I, I recently finished a project related to college applications and it was focused largely in Texas, but you know, nationwide too. When's the last time any of y'all any ever got into your application system? So like, you know, you use the Common App or if you're in Texas, you used Apply Texas, you actually logged into it. When's the last time y'all logged into the FAFSA and tried completing it or, or at least creating a new profile and seeing what it looks like from the student's perspective? Have you downloaded the My Student Aid app and have you looked through the app any? I mean, understanding what the student sees, it's really kind of, uh, shocking that how different things can look and feel and be phrased from the federal level to institutions to states. So understanding things experienced from a student perspective all the way down that funnel. Um, embedding contact information into modes of communication, when and where can students get help? One thing I, that we didn't draw attention to is that every single piece of information that Alyssa had shared there's a way for a student to contact somebody to get a question answered in some capacity. There's, there's help along the way, the entire way, so that students can reach out and have their questions answered. Minimizing jargon and acronyms and sentence length to the best of your ability. You can make sure to do verb first and then use bullet points. And if you notice Alyssa's steps was one through five, it's explore and apply and complete. It's simple verbs, they're action oriented, and they're not full long sentences. They're nice little short bullet points that are action oriented at the front of the sentence. That's fantastic. Assuming unfamiliarity, right? Now, would Alyssa's team sent that pause and complete your FAFSA message to FTIC students who had maybe never understood what the pause portal was or what the FAFSA was? I mean, understanding your audience, one kind of tenet of good writing is who are you writing for? Like who's your audience? And how can you cater that material to your audience? Assuming a lot of students may be first gen or they may not have a support network or a college counselor helping them through the process, assume that they might not know. And when you're sending information like 
you know, verification nudges, define that process for students because it might be their first time ever experiencing it. And how often do we in our society experience terms like unsubsidized and 4506T and verification? These are terms that you only really experience in a post-secondary process situation. Nowhere else in our society are those terms used. So when are students gonna learn them? Largely during these processes. So assume that they might not know them. Also assume maybe an eighth grade level of reading comprehension, right? The average US adult, about the seventh or eighth grade level. And again, the average college student or the prospective student is not going to read and comprehend at the 12th grade level. So making sure that you pair the communication down as much as you can, and you don't have to lose messaging. Alyssa's examples are brilliant because it's not like they're withholding a ton of information or they're substantially changing the messaging. They're just making it simpler. Students are still getting everything they need to get just in a simpler mode of communication. It doesn't have to be a massive cutting of stuff. It's just a, a, a paring down and then a, a simplification of that. And then if you notice too, there are graphics and there are buttons, right? Leveraging technology. We had one person in the Q&A ask, what if our financial aid communication system is plain text only? I would maybe consider you then to use like a mail merge technology or MailChimp or some other form of communication that can allow for more multimedia as long as you're ADA compliant, right? That's a whole other discussion, but making sure that it is equitable for all students to access. What was great about Alyssa's communication is that there are strong color contrast. The font is big and readable. It goes one, two, three, four, five. It has a logical order. It's very compliant and very easy for all students from all ability levels to access. That's very, very important. If your information system doesn't allow for a lot of multimedia integration, explore other ways that you can use different, maybe free or low cost technologies to send out those massive FAFSA reminders. Or if you can homebrew something in house that allows you to add an infographic or a picture, something where you can harness 21st century technologies because students are all about getting things graphically, having it being you know, simple and complete, so they can complete a process very simply without having to do too much reading, quite frankly. Um, Alyssa, do you want to piggyback on, on anything I just mentioned about best practices or anything that kind of sticks out to you as really important? Yeah, actually from um, the Q&A, we had Darcy ask um, if we create our own videos or um, if we use the FSA ones. Um, so we actually are also con contact, uh, contracted with Ocelot. Um, they're formerly Financial Aid TV. So we do have a suite of Financial Aid TV uh, videos that are, are canned um, and any university can use. Um, we use some of the F FSA videos, but we, we are very lucky um, that our marketing division it has contracted with a company named Vidyard, and we are hopefully very soon going to be able to produce some videos that are more Georgia State specific about our processes, um, maybe about financial literacy. Um, we've got a couple of things coming up where we're trying to partner with students because, you know, nothing is better than the student communicating what they need to do. So uh, social media tries to have us involved in like Tour Tuesday um, or create little snippets of videos that are just very informational and that can be sent out, you know, through Instagram Live or TikTok, things like that. Yeah, great point. And we have a couple other, we can kind of transition to Q&A Q &A time. Um, a few folks asked, you know, if your students are in med school, what grade level comprehension should we be assuming? you know, something like 17th or 18th if they're in med school. However, go back to uh, instructions for how to change your own oil in your car. I, I know how to do it myself, but I had to actually watch a YouTube video and read multiple tutorials to understand what certain car parts were. And I had to learn that language all over again. So even though, you know, I have a, had a master's degree at the time when I learned and I could read at an 18th grade level or 16th grade level, it didn't mean that I understood car jargon or car parlance. So do students understand financial aid 
jargon. You know, if a student is in med school, if they had completed the FAFSA and they did take out loans as an undergraduate, maybe they would have had experience with that language. Maybe not. So you really can't assume familiarity because the language is so niche and so contextualized. Same thing that someone else said in the Q&A, have you found that students are more likely to understand and grasp terms as time goes on? Well, basic tenets of literacy would say, yes, as words are repeated, the meaning of those words and context reinforces meaning. So if you see the word pause in one context, in P-A-W-S, in one context, and you keep seeing it, that meaning is reinforced, and that's how you learn words. So as long as the words are being used consistently across your communication channels, then yes, that would reinforce meaning. But really, there's not a whole lot of empirical research that shows that if a student is selected for verification the first time and they learn those terms, they know exactly what they're doing each subsequent time. Kind of tough research to do, but basic tenets of literacy would say if you repeat the same terms over and over and use them in different contexts consistently and clearly, students should be able to learn those terms and you should be able to then you know, help them through processes even easier. Um, had another question come in from a practitioner, and I think Alyssa, this is a good one kind of for you to take. Uh, from the pause and pounce image only emails, did you find that students who clicked completed um, what they were supposed to complete on the page they landed on? So have you, have you been able to tie essentially that click rate over into the completion rate of the process? Yeah, so um, Zach, <laughs> Zach and I thought about trying to um, include some of this information, but I, I hadn't quite gotten him all my data yet, so that's, that's my bad. I do know that from the analysis that we've done within the first five days, we did have about um, 1,000 students between for, that, for those treatment groups um, complete within the first five days um, of the FAFSA opening last year, which is pretty good for us. That's a, that's a significant improvement over the first five days of the last year, even though it's only a very small percentage of our student population. Um, so, but we, I mean, we'll take any percentage, right, <laughs> of improvement. So, um, but what we have seen also over time, um, over the course of that month in October was that the um, students who received the treatment group email did complete at a higher rate for the month of October. Although, I, just to be very honest, I don't remember the numbers off my off the top of my head. So, awesome. Um, a couple other just comments that came into the chat. We had someone um, from Winona, Winona State up north. I love that. Uh, shout out to all the WSU folks up there in Minnesota. Um, having trouble getting students to even read emails, they're more focused in texts because they're always in their phones. Yes, so perhaps unrelated, but hear me out on this. I recently learned that a lot of public university systems in Texas, about 30 to 40% of their prospective students finish their application on their phone. So they begin and they finish their application for admission entirely on their phone. Even if it's easier to like, you know, use a desktop or a laptop and attach the essay as a PDF or whatever, students are using their phones for more than ever. That's why FSA, you know, started developing the My Student Aid app because they knew that students were going to be on their phones. And two, what's great about Alyssa's communication is it looks pretty Instagram friendly, right? I mean, it's in that rectangular shape and it fits nicely on a cell phone screen. Students aren't having to pinch and zoom to get information. It's right there and guess what? They can just tap on it, tap once and they're there. That is short and simple and it hits them exactly where they are, which is on their cell phone. We didn't talk a lot about mobile technology, but a lot of these principles carry right over and the pause and the pounce graphics are really, really mobile friendly. And I guess, Alyssa, have you gotten any feedback from students about like, you know, what devices they're using and how they kind of prefer to be communicated with? Yeah, so they, our students are predominantly on their phones as well. And I think we see this in their behavior as well, because we also sometimes, you know, Don, the rate on those emails was very unusual. Like, 
I said, usually we're running at about a 13% open rate. And I think this is where the alignment with the other units really comes into play. You know, everything that we do via email, we're following up with text messaging within the next usually 72 hours. Um, a lot of times there's multiple social media campaigns that are going that are also mirroring what some of our communications are saying or even sometimes pointing them back to the emails that they've received. So um, we try to consistently reinforce that they should be checking their email, right, and reading our messages. We don't message them for no reason, right? Um, but then I think it's very important you know, that we follow that with additional messages that are very reflective of the same thing. Um, you know, they, the, the, our social media team didn't utilize these images, even though they are very social media compatible. Um, but the language, as long as sometimes the language is the same, I think that does a, goes a long way to reinforce things. Yeah, and the last thing I want to talk about, then we're going to wrap it up here. Someone asked about aesthetics of emails and the aesthetics of and, and feedback. You know, from a, a professional marketing standpoint, you want strong color contrast. You want the font to be readable. Usually, font size 16 or larger on mobile devices and desktop devices are very easily readable. Use a commonly used font like a even though it's boring, like a Times New Roman or a Georgia or a Verdana, those are ADA accessible and compliant and they're also very readable because they are serif fonts and they have little feet on them. So you can tell the difference between a capital I and a lowercase L. We may not think it's very important, but let me tell you, students with low vision and folks with disabilities really appreciate us looking out that way and using an accessible font, strong color contrast. And also one tip is just making it a step in a process. I mean, seeing that one through five and then carrying that over into bullet points in a one, two, three, four, five process. That philosophy was carried over into all of Alyssa's communication and those are parts of the aesthetics. It's how the email is designed and laid out and it's consistent. It's using the school color scheme with strong contrast and readable font all the way throughout the process. It was, it's fantastic. Um, Alyssa, do you wanna add anything more to that about email aesthetics and how to make things look prettier or more attractive? Um, yeah, so I, I will say that we're very, very, very lucky to have a very strong par partnership with um, an entire department of amazing um, PR and marketing um, staff members. So there's a, not a lot I actually have to do <laughs> a lot of the time, um, but some of these things are very doable, either if you have like Adobe Spark or even just using some, some of the free applications like um, <clears throat> Canva. I occasionally will mock something up in Canva right on my phone um, or using their website and I will send it over to PRMC and they will make it better. Um, or sometimes, especially if it's to like a smaller group of students and I don't have to get like so much approval, um, I you know, will just use something that I've created just on my own out of either Canva or Adobe Spark um, and I really just try to stick to, you know, making sure that it's the same brand color, making sure I'm not breaking any of PRMC's major rules, but, you know, making it very simple messaging, the font is, needs to be very clear. Um, and we try to, we've started adding more and more images. Um, I have a, a couple of, of things I could send to Zach that I've created just on my own that we've used occasionally. Um, and um, and they were pretty easy. I just add in a photo, put the colors in, make it a simple message, make it clickable. So excellent. All right. So with that, we covered a ton of ground, and uh, I think Alyssa will be back. I hope later this semester we're going to maybe talk a little bit more about um, perhaps web design and how to make the financial aid website as appealing as your communications can be now. So uh, with that, we're gonna wrap it up. Our contact information is up there. You're gonna get an email from me if you registered with uh, the slides as a PDF and a link to the recording. Feel free to send that out to anyone and anywhere that is interested. 
And then email Alyssa and I. Alyssa and I's emails are located on the screen there. Please send us an email. I always try to, and I think Alyssa's the same way, get good examples from, from places. And, you know, financial aid communication can kind of be begging and borrowing and stealing from folks about what works for students. So we can send you examples. You have the examples on the PowerPoint today to make sure that you're doing everything you can to simplify and consolidate financial aid communication. Because that was the title of the darn webinar today. That's what it was, simplifying, consolidating financial aid. Anyways, with that, thank you everyone. Uh, on behalf of my colleague, Alyssa, from Georgia State University. My name is Zach. Thank you for joining us and we'll be in touch soon. Take care, everyone.